With us today is Estelle Morris. Estelle was a teacher, then she was an MP. Eventually she was Secretary of State for Education, a job she famously gave up in 2002, saying that she wasn't up to it. And next she became Minister for the Arts. And in that job she announced that she'd be standing down at the next Parliament. I've always seen Estelle as a teacher. I mean, is that fair, Estelle? Have you really always been a teacher, even though you became a politician? I, I, su I suppose so, if you think of a, a, set of, a set of skills. But strangely, I've seen lots of other people I think have always been teachers, even though they've never been in a classroom or trained mm. as a teacher. So I think there's some skills you develop as a teacher which you don't actually lose. Yeah. And I think that's been for the good. And how many years did you teach? 18, um, 74 to 92. And you enjoyed it? Yes, but there were ups and downs. Yeah. I mean, if you asked me if I came home exhilaratedly happy every single day, yeah. the answer was no. I can remember some tough classes I had, particularly as a younger teacher. But if I enjoyed it as a career, I did very, very much indeed. Do you think you're good at it? Yes, I was okay. I mean, people say you're good at it. But, I hope so. I, mean, I suppose I was like, like most people. Um, on a really, really good day, I was yeah. pretty good. Um, I had my bad days, and for most of the time, I think I did a reasonable job. So, when you were teaching, uh, what sort of job did you do? I mean, were you a head of department or...? Well, I, I, I did something which I wouldn't advise anybody else to do, and that's I, I went to uh, Sydney Stringer School in the city of Coventry as a probationary teacher, as it was called in those days, and I never left. By the time I finished, I was head of sixth form, so I had responsibility for pastoral and curriculum together, and that's what I really liked, because I always yeah. thought it was a bit of a, a false split between pastoral yeah. and curriculum responsibilities. So why did you go into politics then? Because you were enjoying teaching, so why go into politics? I always wanted to. I came from a political family, mm. so politics had been... Who was, who been was in the, uh, politics? Your father and your A lot of them, to uncle, yeah, but yeah. mum and dad um, met in the Labour League of Youth, uh, which was the equivalent <laughs> of the Young Socialists, and my dad's brother, who also became an MP, met my mum's best friend, so the two oh, boys right. went to the League of Youth, the two girls did, and made two, two marriages of it and two MPs out of it. But I always knew, I always used to say to myself that if I lived to be old and I'd look back on my life and I'd not got to be an MP but I tried, I could have lived with it. If I'd never tried, I would have felt I'd let myself down. It was the thing I wanted to do. No and did you dream of a, a position of power and authority one day, that you might be in charge of something, be able to do something about the education system, or did you enter no, as an didn't. MP? No, the ambition was to, remember there's a fault in that, the ambition was to be a member of parliament, mm -hmm. and that, that, if I thought if I could get to that, I'd have achieved yeah. all I ever wanted, in, we wanted to do. So modest ambitions? It, it didn't seem modest at the, t at the time, Ted, it, it seemed quite a big thing, yeah. but the truth is, the minute you get there, is that a human nature, if you look around, you think, hang on, I'm the, I think I'm as good as the person who's got the ministerial job, so yeah, I think it's a good thing about human nature, you, you want to get on all the time. And you started off in opposition, so when, when it came up to the 1997 election, were you involved before that in the sort of thinking about education if Labour got into power? Uh, yes, and it's from one of the, they were glorious days, they, they, they really... In what sense? Well, I was new in 92, mm. so although we'd had the disappointment of losing, those of us who took seats from the Tories in 92 were protected. Did you had a thin majority, group. didn't you? I did. I won by 162 yeah. after one recount. So yeah. it was 166 before the recount. But already we were, it was a bit like holding your breath. We mm. never said to each other in opposition, look, next time we're going to make it, because you know, we thought that in 92. And what was really interesting was the rest of the world were beginning to believe that Labour would be in power. So if we wanted to speak to anybody about anything to do with education, at that time we had ready access. And I was under David Blunkett's team. I, I love working with him. He's a great, he's a great team leader and he's, he's a very generous boss. And they were just good days of policy development. Um, very, very exciting. Now, when you actually became a minister, here was your chance. It was unusual, wasn't it, for a minister in education to have actually been a teacher as long as you'd been a teacher. I mean, did you have any kind of particular classroom focus? What sort of ambitions did you have when you first came in? I think what I bought that was different to David or Stephen Byers was that I, I did know how the classroom worked. And I hope that I had an ability to look at a policy that might be developed and actually say, come on, it, it doesn't quite work like that. So bringing the mechanisms of policy and vision together with practicalities was something only I could do because only I'd had that experience. But I think there's perhaps something a bit bigger than that, is that I'd been determined to do, I wanted to do my politics by being more outward looking than inward looking. And I, I, personally as a learner, I'd, I'd much sooner talk to people to learn than to read tombs of books. It's just 
the nature of my learning. So, Did you I, think as a teacher? I mean, when you were thinking about policy and so yes, on, I did. were you kind of imagining yourself back yes, in the I classroom did. thinking, if somebody said this, how would I react? Absolutely. I'll tell you just a, a, a tiny example that's not quite that, a tiny, tiny example. Was I went in this big, big department, and um, they, you get a message and they say, well, have they uh, call all head teachers to a conference on September the 12th? I said, well, hang on, September the 12th. They'll have been back mm -hmm. five days. They've got New Year 7s. They've got the new timetable to sort of, it's not the best time mm -hmm. to actually get teachers. And there was no sense of the rhythm of the school year in the department. And I said to them, I said, you've got to have a big diary. I said, and on it, you've got to put the key events for schools, when the exams are, when the nativity play is going to begin, all that. And what they didn't have and they couldn't have, but what I had, was you know that notion of the rhythm of the school year? Yeah. And when you can get teachers at the best, mm. you call a teachers' meeting, uh, you know, even the 11th of December, and every teacher will know you're not going to get them at the best because they're absolutely yeah. weird. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to give the impression, Ted, that that's all I thought I could bring to politics because I was a politician then and not a teacher, yeah. and I was very keen to make the break in the best sense of the world. But I, I did try to put my knowledge of the rhythm of education and schools into the system. Now, what I found surprising, you see, was that having been a teacher, you were in government in that period that became very prescriptive. Yes. And in many ways, teachers like to be kind of proudly autonomous. They don't usually like politicians telling them what to do, and particularly not every few minutes has happened in the literacy and numeracy. Hour. So how did that come about? I never... It seemed very un estelle like Yeah, it, it wasn't in actual fact, but I'm prepared to say I'd changed my mind. I never, you know, if there are any doubts about anything I ever did in education, they that, that, that's not one of them. And it, but it does come from my own teaching experiences. And two things, when I taught, in, two examples, when I taught in the, in the city, I did a GCSE class. And when I taught in the 70s and 80s, I used to look at my results every year. And I used to think whether my kids had done well or, or not well. And I think I used to think, have they done better than last year, my group last year, or worse than my group last year? And I suddenly realized I had no mechanism for comparing how I'd done as a teacher and my children had done compared with children in similar circumstances elsewhere in the city or elsewhere in the country. And I, just two things, I realised I realized how insular my teaching had been. But the second, and this is actually more important, I can remember my first tutor group, Three Blue, way before year seven, eight and nine, but current year nine, I was 22, it was 1974, multiracial inner city school. I had these three white boys in my class, I won't name them, three white boys in my class. I only say white because they were three of only four white boys in the class. They could barely read and write Ted. Uh, their, their, their literacy levels were so, so very low and they were tiny little kids. They, they, they looked poor, if you, you know what I mean by that. I'd never been taught how to teach a child to read and write. I was a secondary trained teacher. And if I'm honest, and what I'm really ashamed about and worry about is from when those three lads came to our school at 11, and we were a good school, till when they left at 16, I don't think their ability to read and write improved. And what I learned was that they got, just got disadvantage on disadvantage, and I'd got into teaching to get rid of disadvantage. So I realised that the literacy and numeracy teaching just had to be better yeah. in primary but school. But that's an argument for having literacy and numeracy teaching. But at the point I was making was, as a teacher, if some government officer at that time had come along to you and said, you've got to start your lesson with 15 minutes of this, and then when you finished, 15 minutes of that, and then 20 minutes of something else, and finish up with 10 minutes. I mean, wouldn't you have said, hold on a minute, I'm here with these people, I know these children. Oh, Why are you telling me oh, to do probably, this? I probably, I, I've never ever pretended this is really interesting, and I'll never know. I've never pretended that I wouldn't have reacted if I'd have been a teacher as teachers Well, you're rotter then if you I didn't know, no, 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 think no. back to it. No, but I did think that, but the perceptions, you know, what had happened to me, you know, I had left, that wasn't my, my job. I'd, I'd had the opportunity to reflect, to look at other practice, to look at evidence. And i tell you what I might have said to the person who came into the classroom to that. Thank God, for the first time, someone's coming along and offering me professional development, because no one did that while I was a teacher. Actually, time out to be trained. Thank God you're respecting my professionalism by showing me evidence of what works elsewhere, 
And just as if I was a doctor or any other profession, I could base my own work on that evidence. But then you wouldn't you have said, and I hope I've got the option to do other things instead, rather than this yes, kind of I heavy think, leaning I, on no, I think, Ted, that and happened I, at that time. I know, I, I know what you feel about this. And I think I'd have moaned, but I think what I always knew, and I think the decent, the, the good politician always has the medium and long term in view. I, th I knew as the politician that there would be a time when that's exactly what teachers would do. They would actually say, OK, we've done the literary strategy, we've taken from it what is good, we're now going to mould it to our own. But I'll tell you what my worry was, and I think I was right about this. If we'd have said to the teachers, look, there's all this money to train you, and there's this evidence-based best practice, but we respect your professionalism, and it's up to you whether you do it or not, I know who'd have said they'd have done it and tried it, it'd have been the best teachers, because good teachers do that. The ones who wouldn't would have been the bad teachers, and whether we like it or not, there are some bad teachers around. And we had to have a mechanism for making every single teacher get trained in best practice literacy and numeracy. Now, what about the thorny issue of selection? Because actually, this was supposed to be a Labour biggie, wasn't it? Labour had yes, been opposed to selection. Time. David Blunkett said, read my lips, no more selection, mm -hmm. and so on. And then, apparently, nothing happened. Do you think that was a cop-out? Yes. I mean, what I, I think there's two arguments, and politics is about competing demands. I think this was the choice. Um, the danger was that we'd taken grammar schools on, that we would have got bogged down in a Daily Mail, Daily Telegraph, Sunday Times um, kerfuffle about selection from 97 till 2001. I, you know, I do feel bad about that, but it's the nature of political decision. I think, um, no, I know the decision was right, but I, I grant you there were consequences for those who wanted to get rid of selection. Well, let's move on to when you became a cabinet minister. I mean, was it a big move up, going to be in the cabinet instead of being minister for schools? And then, of course, your political opponent started throwing out you, well, she failed her A-levels, and she's in the lap of the unions. How yeah, did you react to all that? I, I never minded the A-level thing. I did fail my A-levels. I mean, um... Why do, you, why do you think you failed them, by the way? I mean, you're a bright person. Oh, don't you think I've not asked myself that? Because, to tell you the truth, that, that failure stayed with me throughout my life. Yeah. And if I lack confidence at all, it's partly down to I mean, that, that's that, amazing. That I find that amazing, because you've done all these jobs. And I think it's taking the time to learn that. I think, I think what, what a do thing. I mean, my, my good friend, our good friend, Tim Brighouse, uh, gave me the Howard Garner book once and says, look, there's more, there's lots of intelligences, lots of intelligence, not just yeah. <laughs> your intelligence to pass exams. Get he says, one you like. He says, you know, cho yeah, choose one you like and you've got some of them. I, I now know that. Why did I fail my exams? I think I never, two, two, two things I failed the exams. I got off to a very bad start at grammar school. I was ill the second week and I found the transition difficult. I came from a, a council estate primary school that hadn't, it was a good school, but it hadn't begun to do the secondary school curriculum, French, science, algebra. I was put in with kids from a middle class background had already started to do the secondary school curriculum. I missed the second week through absence, and I've always known... And then you didn't really recover. I never, I never yeah, recovered. Yeah. I don't think I knew how to revise. I mm. knew I was perfectly bright in other areas, but I'd revise and revise and revise, and I couldn't write it down on paper in a way that got me many marks, and it's made me... Just to say this, Ted, because I think this is important for anyone listening, whatever strengths I've got, they're also because I failed my A-levels. Yeah. It's not just a one-way street. Yeah, as well. yeah. Now, what about when you actually occupied this very high-profile office? Because, of course, one of the things that happens is you're more in the eye of the Prime Minister. Yeah. And one concern that many people have is that under uh, Tony Blair, there's been a much stronger central direction from the Prime Minister's own office. And indeed, as Secretary of State, um, Andrew Adonis was the first person, I understand, to visit you the morning that you started your job in the department. Uh, was that a tension? I mean, didn't you, descri didn't you describe him as a necessary, necessary evil at one stage? No, no, I think so. Uh, it wasn't evil, because I don't think Andrew's evil. It was... Um, I mean, it's something like unnecessary aggravation, I think. It was, it was slightly less than that. What you have to remember is, if you're Prime Minister, you need somebody who does the liaison between you and the departments. Because, you know, Prime Minister is, 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 is our leader, he's our Prime Minister, and he's entitled and needs and must actually take But he's not a president. Interest. And he's I mean, one of the president. things that concerned me was that some of the ideas coming out of the number 10 office seemed to me dotty. I mean, for example, the prop proposition that there should be an advanced extension exam when yeah. schools were wilting under ANAS level and had quite yeah. a lot on their plates, and to launch this one on top, which was a strong push from number yeah. 10, seemed to me wrong. Now, as Secretary of State, you have to contend, you have to balance this, you, you don't do, you? You do, and you describe the process as it is. If you've got the Prime Minister very interested in education, and you've got Andrew, a, you know, a young, bright, intellectual spark, being asked to mind, watch education for the Prime Minister, 
you're bound to actually get differences of opinion. Now, I'm not going to pretend there weren't. That would be silly and childish, and no one would believe me. So there were times when number 10 would want to do things we didn't. And then it's, it's a bit like if a head teacher wants you to do something, you're head of the humanities faculty, and you don't. And it's that process. But did you say get lost? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes you say, I mean, what you say to an advisor, not just Andrew, you say, if that's what the Prime Minister wants to do, I'll discuss it with the Prime Minister, thank you very much. And then you tell him to get lost? No, because what that does, <laughs> it sifts out whether the Prime Minister wanted it or the advisor wanted oh, it. Right. And it's a great supposing the Prime Minister process. wanted it and you didn't you go want and have it. A chat. You go and have a chat. And uh, you, you come to a compromise. I can, think of, I can think of lots of ideas that are better because, lots of policies that are better because initially there was a tension in ideas. If you're asking, did it, w w was, it a, was it a problem? It wasn't a problem. But I think every Secretary of State has known, or every private office has known every Secretary of State come back and say, damn it, you know, I've now got was to Was it this, not a problem because you are a, an easy person to work with and you would, if necessary, give ground? I or, I or was it that, in the end, you were on the same wavelength anyway? But I don't think I give ground. I think that... Um, I think those who know me and work with me will know that I can get my own way. But I don't do it by shouting. I take my time. And this, you asked me to begin with whether there was still of me a bit that was a teacher. And every teacher knows that what you do when you want your own way is you let the child think it was their idea in the first place. Now, that lesson serves you throughout life. And I want to ask you who you're referring to. No, but if, you, if, you can, uh, if you can... What's wrong with doing politics in a way that makes those who opposed you not feel they've been battered into submission. Now, there are those who think I was weak because I don't go and push and shout. And I have to live with that, and that's their judgment. But I don't like their style of politics. And, I mean, one of the things I'm really strong about is I was going to do the politics my way. I was going to run that department in my style with an open door, with people welcome to come in, with no official whatever level being sh be frightened to say what they wanted. Now, if macho men, and I'm sorry it is men, round the rest of Whitehall, uh, there are some, but women don't tend to do their politics that way. If that becomes a sign of political weakness, and, it, and I know it did, I know people said that, maybe that's a reflection on the way we do politics. Now, I know you don't like talking about this, but then things went wrong. Yeah. And I thought during that time, you looked absolutely terrible on television. You were really suffering. Uh, you know, you were upset, the exams had gone amiss, and it clearly showed. I thought that was a strength of yours, actually, that you're a real person. Uh, but obviously, it was a very difficult time for you. What do you think about it now, in reflection, when you look back? It's a, if you think of life, it's a three months. I mean, uh, I went on holiday, and while I was on holiday, the uh, criminal uh, CRB... Uh, oh, teachers getting police teachers clearance, yeah. All, all that, if you remember... The, and that wasn't yours, was it? I mean, that was really the Home Office. No, no, I mean, I'm not going to say it now, sort of getting rid of responsibility, but the truth was, when I got back from Australia on holiday, the kerfuffle had already begun, mm. and uh, I remember the first thing I was told was, look, we've got a school in Leicester, I think it was, think it was Moat, um, who can't start tomorrow morning because they haven't got Czech teachers. Mm. I just got back from holiday, I said, when can they be checked by? At that point, I, that was Thursday, I was told would be every school be checked by Monday. And the decision then seemed right, I said, well, if it'll be checked by Monday, leave it and we'll, cut, we'll, we'll live through today mm. and tomorrow. The truth was, they weren't checked within three months. Yeah. So two weeks later, or I think it was actually only a week later, I have to backtrack. But what, what, what do I think about it looking back? Well, I what about the exams part of it? Because, I mean, in a sense, as uh, Secretary of State, you actually weren't allowed to interfere, yeah. were you? I mean, you can't go in and tell examiners That's to give more or fewer passes, but that was what was being said at that, that hurt, time. That hurt a great deal. That hurt a great deal because the notion that... The no, I mean, the notion that I would have, that any one of us w would have gone to an examiner and said, uh, and mark it this way, mark them hard, this is the logic, mark them hard so that they'll fail, so that the government can claim they're being tough on standards, was so bizarre. And you have this surreal thing where you think, well, no one serious can think that, so you ignore it. And as the days roll by, you realise that people do think that. But... You know, we could talk for hours about little things about how you feel and how you reacted. What I did know is that the whole department, by October, was revolving around the political pressure I was under. It wasn't getting on with the job. And so what was the final straw? I mean, why oh, did you eventually... I mean, you quit one day. And I, could, I, I think I, people were quite surprised, because you'd had a hard time earlier, but then one day you just said you were going. Well, look, because the real difference was... Well, 
I didn't say this at the time, but I was picking up the pieces of the CRB and the A-levels. They weren't my policies. They were done before the election. And it's my job to take responsibility and to sort out the trouble. And I think I sorted the trouble out well. But when it came to literacy and numeracy, that was about what I said. I couldn't in you my own... You said you'd resign. I said I'd resign. And that why did you do me. that? Why did I say it? Mm. Because I was asked whether... Um, <laughs> I was asked whether I would resign if we didn't meet the levels, and I said yes. And was that to support David Blunkett? Because yes. But he didn't actually say he'd resign, you see. I, I mean, he's an old fox. Time. What he said was, if we don't meet the targets, my head, head will be, be on, on the block. block. And you walked in and said, well, I'll resign. Yeah, but I, and I, then I, you did. I tell you, I didn't know, uh, it's just a little bit of history, I didn't know until after I'd resigned in 2001 that he'd not said he would, he'd have resigned. Mm. But I did say I would resign. and. You know, I've asked teachers to, to say to themselves and think of themselves listening to the Today programme, driving to school in the morning, and I'm in one of those difficult interviews with John Humphreys, and John Humphreys says, but Estelle Morris, how can anyone ever believe you again when you say quite clearly you resign you're not? Teachers would actually, it doesn't matter, teachers, parents would actually say, John Humphreys is right, because see, that's the nature of the judgment of the public. You see, here's the interesting thing, because uh, you, you see that as a very low point, but I remember you being mobbed by teachers. Uh, because you became incredibly popular. I mean, I remember at the Teaching Awards, for example, where there were about 500 teachers, and they were absolutely all gathering around you because it was not long after you'd resigned. Saturday after the Thursday. And they, and they actually saw you as a heroic person because they said, many of them said, well, isn't it a pity that uh, Estelle's portrayed as a weak woman? It's almost as if that style of politics, from a woman maybe, uh, is not possible and that what we really need is a tough rhinoceros. No disrespect to Charles Clark, but I mean that was being said, wasn't it? Need a tough guy. Yeah. I think I think that's right. I mean I was he's immensely grateful for the response of teachers. It saw me through some pretty bad weeks, I suppose, where you know you get all these self doubts. And there really is an issue about the style of government because I don't think I was weak. I think I had a different style. And I can list the things which I think I drove through. I mean, if I may say, there would have been no workforce reform movement had I not started it off before I left. I'm, I'm not taking away from the terrific job that David Miliband's done in developing it and taking it forward. But we live at a time when politicians are judged by some macho thing of how, how much they can stand the heat. And do you think I don't no, think that's right for democracy. No, but do you think then there's no place for a woman like yourself who clearly grieves when something goes wrong and shows it? I mean, does it, is it a kind of sad conclusion when no, I mean, some, 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 some men do. I mean, we, 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 we've seen in past months David Blunkett do exactly the same. So men do show when, when they're sad and when they, when they grieve as well. Um, do, you know, do you know, Ted, it is about showing your emotions, but I think it's about, I think it's the, the style of politics you and I are talking about. Uh, it's about not spinning. It's about not going out to too many lunches with, you know, journalists to plant stories. And it's about n not thinking that victory is about getting the good headline. It's actually about remembering it's delivering the decent policies. And I wish there was a wider debate about how we do politics in this country and the nature of the relationship, that three-cornered relationship between politicians, the media and the electorate. I raised the debate when I left and there was a bit of me that hoped that there would be a difference, a change. And I'm not sure I've seen that change yet. And uh, I don't want anyone else to have to resign, but I would very much like to be part of an ongoing debate about that. Wouldn't you have found it difficult anyway because you'd made your opposition to top up university fees known, for example, and had you been Secretary of State, you'd have actually had to negotiate all that through, and yet it went against your beliefs? It would have been a difficulty, and I, I have always said that, that leaving solved that problem for me. Um, but, and I, I just don't know the other scenario, but what I would say is that by the time Charles and Alan, uh, Alan Johnson had developed it, I, I think it was a, a far, far, far better policy that was passed than ever, you know, we, we, we was first, uh, was first started with. Now, in terms of the future, what do you think Estelle Morris will be doing in 10 years' time? Because you've got plenty of working so. years ahead of you. Uh, I mean, 10 years from now, what would you see yourself as doing? I'd like to be something where I've not wasted the time I had either in school, my first career, in Parliament, my second career. What that might be, I, I, I don't know, but I feel a bit like a 22-year-old again looking forward to what um, you know, the next section of my career might offer me. And why did you leave politics, you see? Because, I mean, you went from the very bottom, an ordinary teacher, to a senior teacher, to a junior MP, to a more senior MP, a minister, secretary of state, right in the cabinet, 
a position where you can do as much as any individual is likely ever to be able to do. And then you decide to leave politics where the power is to go and do something else. Why, why do you feel you can do something better or different outside Parliament? Because I lost the power when I left the Cabinet. And you're absolutely right that being in politics is about using the power you know, to, 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 to try and realise your vision. And it's not easy for an ex-Cabinet Minister. And there's a real risk that you either become a cynic on the back benches or you roam around not quite knowing what your role is. I feel at the moment energised, full of ideas. I want to do things. I don't think I can achieve anything more in the House of Commons. If you were making a judgement on yourself and looking back at your career in politics, both as a beginner MP and a cabinet minister, how would you assess your main contribution? I mean, what are you most proud of and what are you most uh, fearful that people will say that you didn't do that you should have done? I'm most proud that I think people felt I felt I talked straight with them. And I'm most proud that people say to me sometimes, you're a different sort of politician, because I actually think that shows some strength. I'm least, the things I, I worry about or I regret is I, I do wonder had I prepared for the Secretary of State's job, had I had more time to prepare for it and think about it, um, I might have overcome some of the difficulties that actually stood in my way. So what I regret most, in a strange way, and life never delivers you all at once, is I was right to leave, but I was sad to go. And I often, on a quiet moment, do ask myself, how would things have worked out had I stayed? And I'll never know it, and that has to be a regret. And early in your new life, what would you actually say to teachers who are still there? Is there any message in the light of your political and your teaching experience that you think the present and next generation of teachers need to hear? I think I'd actually remind them, that, especially the youngsters, that they are the great beneficiaries of um, better training, more money, all those things as old is actually fought for. And they should be very, very confident. And I think they come into, they come into teaching at a time when it really is a profession that has come of age, where it is respected by the rest of the public, and a lot is asked of it. I genuinely think, Ted, that now is a really exciting time to be in teaching. And what I can tell them is when you've finished and see those kids grow up, taking their place in our life, being useful and fulfilled and good citizens, you realise that even the bad after Friday afternoon comes to some good at the end of it. Estelle, thanks very much and all the best for the future. Thank you, Ted.